Aren't you supposed to be, you know, helping these patients? Oh, it's just much more fun to cut them up, John. Hello and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. I'm Junglist. Coming up on the show this week, their life is in Bajo's hands with Trauma Center's second opinion. But will it pass the Good Game examination? You're a gun for hire with a full arsenal and an itchy trigger finger in the open world one-man army game Mercenaries 2, where everybody pays. And in Backwards Compatible this week, we're taking a look at the work of game developer Will Wright. From Raid on Bungling Bay to his latest, seven years in the making, Spore. And Lux looks at what drives a very human need to play. And we get an update on the good game game, Office Wars. But first, can you guess the game for this week? A clue. War has never been so much fun. News time, Badge. What are you doing? Can't get out. Dr. Badger, ladies and gentlemen. Good game. Researchers at Britain's Manchester University have made some interesting discoveries about the unscrupulous practice of massively multiplayer online RPG gold farming. The practice in which players use games like World of Warcraft to earn virtual gold that they then sell to make a real-world profit has been banned by most MMO games. But according to the study, there are more than 400,000 people making a full-time living from gold farming around the world. The hotspot is China, where 80% of all gold farmers are gamefully employed in the game-playing business. Some disappointing news this week for PlayStation 3 players, with Sony announcing that the 160GB version of the console will not be making its way to Australia. The 160GB PS3 has been confirmed for release only in Europe and North America, and that Australians will get an 80GB version instead, which will launch towards the end of August. The Leipzig Game Convention in Germany has now closed, and as always, a few new game announcements have been made. Sega used the event to unveil the latest game in their zombie shoot 'em up series, House of the Dead Overkill, for the Wii, while Konami revealed Lords of Shadow, an action-adventure game that looks to take at least a little inspiration from Konami's own Castlevania series. The 2008 convention also set a new attendance record, with more than 200,000 people reported to have visited this year's show. A group of five games developers and publishers have joined forces to sue 25,000 people accused of illegally sharing game files in the United Kingdom. The group, which includes such big names as Atari and Codemasters, the companies behind games like Race Driver Grid and Overlord, are offering to settle out of court with the alleged software pirates for the sum of £300 each or about 650 Australian dollars per person. The companies have also threatened that at least 500 of the accused will face full legal action. Good game. Mr. Badger. Mr. John. Let's start the review. <laughs> Trauma Center for Nintendo Wii is a reinvented version of the DS game, which we gave some tips on last year. You play Dr. Derek, an up-and-coming surgeon with a fantastic haircut who likes to talk. Starting the operation. The story itself is full of hospital drama. After a few operations, things start to get weird and patients start coming in with some unusual symptoms and internal injuries. Upon closer inspection, you find that some patients are suffering from guilt, a toxin. I persevered with the story for about 20 missions, John, but then I admitted I just couldn't handle it anymore and I went on the skip. I held out a little longer than you, Badge, but yeah, Skip is your friend. As with previous trauma centers, the Wii version is infected with JDS, Japanese Dialogue Syndrome, with an enormous amount of text before you get to the action. For those unfamiliar with Trauma Center, your job is to defibrillate patients, fix wounds, laser tumors, and also take out angry, weird bugs, which are kind of like boss battles, and a few surprises along the way as well. The port from the DS to the Wii is solid, and even though it's not really a good-looking game, it's perfect for the Wii. 
Because you don't have the steadiness of a DS stylus, some of the operations require slower, more precise movements with the Wiimote. On the upside, selecting your tool is easier with the nunchuck, which kind of makes up for having to slice and dice a bit slower. There's the odd interesting use of Z-axis when you're pulling out screws or defibrillating the patients. It is a bit clunky and feels inaccurate, so I guess that's why it's not a main mechanic of the game and you only see it now and then. It's also pretty unforgiving if you make a mistake. You have an injection which can keep patients stable in the event of a mishap, but you're gonna kill a few patients before you master the procedures. Thankfully, you can change the difficulty setting before each operation begins to get you through. Jung, I wasn't a fan of the DS version or its sequel, so I came into this with a prior condition of meh. And they've done a good job with the surgery concept and fleshing it out to a really interesting game, but I just don't get it. It all just feels like one big mini game to me. I'm giving it six and a half out of ten rubber chickens. I thought you liked quirky games. Don't pigeonhole me, Jung. All right, well, you know, it is quirky, but I think at the core of it, it's about fast-paced micro, which is why I like it. I'm giving it 8 out of 10. Good game! Last week, we followed Zach and Tim, the Good Game Game mentorship winners, as they started work on our game, Office Wars. Let's see now how the first week went. It's Friday morning. I've been here a week now. I've just got turfed out of my own seat yesterday. I'm in a new desk. Um, every couple of Fridays they have testing, game testing, where they all sit around and test the games that they're working on. Um, Gameplay-wise, uh, any thoughts, anybody? First battle, way too hard. First battle, too hard, yeah, I got played in this as well. Yeah. This week I've been focusing on getting a style for the game, for the uh, good game Office Wars. With the good game game, we're in pre-production this week, uh, which means we've spent a lot of time concepting characters and just working through the design and ha having a few meetings, talking things through. Today, I think we should be, by the end of the day, we should be coming up with the first real uh, coloured characters that are, we can maybe kick to some of the art, some of the other art guys to look yeah. at some 3D modelling for. Cool. Uh, Zach's been doing some great work on coming up with the characters. He's had a meeting with our art director and they've kind of discussed a style and Zach's taken the style. And he's actually run with that style and done some pretty interesting stuff. I like the colour, I like the mix of colours we've got there. Uh, I thought the, the blue. Steve's been um, just telling me, basically directing me a little bit what looks good, what doesn't, um, what styles to perfect a little bit more and things like that. I draw mainly realistic pictures and this, with this I've had to go a, more, a bit more caricatured and cartoony. I've definitely been going down that way and I'm enjoying the change. We gave uh, Tim a design brief and let him flesh in a bunch of stuff and also leave a bunch of stuff as well that could be called out to the good game community. Um, but Tim's taken the structure and he's really iterated a few times on that and improved on it, done a really, really fantastic job. After one week, I'd say that it was what I thought it would be, but it's a lot better than I thought it would be. It's, it, there's just something about being in this atmosphere, this work-oriented, creative atmosphere that I really enjoy, and the hard work is yet to come. It's, we'll be getting into crunch time because we haven't got that long to work on it, but I'm really looking forward to that. If you've ever wondered what a design document looks like for a game, you can see the full one for Office Wars on the website. And we'll be making regular trips to Melbourne in the coming months to follow Tim, Zach and the rest of the team. Now it's time for After the Game. Tonight on After the Game, an unexpected development of sorts. The untimely demise of all three of our beloved heroes. What a disgrace. A beautiful city street cut down in the prime of its life. Just too short. Shut up, Wretched Crust. Wretched Crust here with breaking news from the past. Today, Pac-Man has found work as a part-time manhole cover. Yo, Pac-Man, can I get you a cup of coffee? Unbeknownst to Pac-Man, his new job is a date with destiny.
это, думаю, замок это. My first day in the fruiter and I get stuck in the traffic. I wouldn't buy shares in this man's psyche. He's bonkers. Could it be that he's reliving a traumatic childhood event? Well, it's a pity that all three heroes were cut down after their prime. The, the fundraising effort goes on. I mean, they've got families. Families and pets. Please. We all have bills to pay, you know. Good game. Whether it's personal or professional, most of our lives are dominated by play. What kids do when they play is trying to establish the rules of a world, basically. It might be a world that they've constructed as a fantasy, or it might be the real world, and they're trying to figure out what the rules are, what sort of goals they might have for themselves. And if you take a step back and you look at what we do with video games, we're doing exactly the same thing. We're exploring a constructed world with rules and states and goals that have been created by a developer. So what is it that draws so many of us into playing video games? And what happens to us when we do? I think there's maybe a lack of complexity in a lot of people's environments. And so people are drawn to play these video games because they're very challenging um, and they're very stimulating. Your brain is basically a great big pattern matcher. And so it searches for patterns. So what games do is they present patterns and encourage you to learn them. Very complex games are probably better for the brain in some, some ways because it, it requires different areas of the brain to coordinate a response or to, to be activated. People look to their entertainment for different things. There's a social aspect to almost all entertainment. People want to read something in order to feel part of a larger group. The other reason that people kind of do it is just to be entertained. They just want to escape. Then the other reason that people look to their media is because they want an extension of their experience. They want to kind of explore things that they won't have a direct opportunity to do in their real lives. And I think that games like something like Bioshock forces you to step into that role, to explore how far is too far, how far do you go to create a perfect society, and also your ability to change that society. That's an extension of your experience, which literature has always done really well, which film has always done really well, but video games are only now able to do. PhD student Bridget Costello has studied the very idea of play when it comes to visual design and has hit upon 13 categories that people fall into when they're engaged in play. I've been trying to find kind of tools that might help me to design a playful experience so I came up with a group of 13 categories that people find enjoyment or pleasure when they're playing in. And they came from all kinds of different people. So people who were game designers, people who were behavioural psychologists. For me, creation is the one that's really tied to that sense of, of having the pleasure of being a cause, of causing something to happen. I like subversion because it's kind of about the pleasure of being naughty and the pleasure of breaking rules. The sensation is about the kind of, um, any kind of physical feeling you might get from the game. I've heard a description of gameplay as being called a twitching bundle of nerves or some expression like that, where they were talking about the way that when, as people played, they were kind of, their bodies were moving in this way that was giving the impression that their muscles were undergoing a kind of mild version of the type of feeling that their character might be going through on the screen. Most of us play video games as a welcome distraction, but there are those of us that just can't get enough and take their downtime pleasure into full-time fun. I remember my parents buying me a Nintendo Entertainment System, a Commodore 64, and a PC, a, a IBM XT, all at the same time. And that just opened up a whole world of um, games and lots of different platforms. And, and when I got that as a kid, um, it just really influenced me um, to where I am now. Tell me about 
why you made the most powerful person in the world. I made the film as a response to all these different stories that I'd been reading on the internet about uh, how games were bad for us, how you know they cause aggression in people pil and things like that, and all these things didn't resonate with me. I didn't find them accurate, so I wanted to, I guess, defend the medium to people who, um, I guess, didn't have an insight to what I had, which was um, growing up with them and loving them. Humans. We want to know, to understand, to explore, to seek, to experience and to feel. Video games in particular offer us all of these things while still in the comfort and safety of our own home. I don't think anyone thinks about why they play, but I definitely think people need to play or, you know, it would be a very sad world. We'd all be very unhappy. <laughs> Next week, we'll be taking a look at Spore, the latest project by one of the most influential and successful game developers of all time, Will Wright. But before we do that, we think it's time to take a look back at Will's career and works, backwards compatible style. William Wright was born on January 20th, 1960, in Atlanta, USA, to an engineer father and an actress mother. As a child, he was obsessed with learning and immersed himself in books, and he would later keep himself occupied building homemade robots, a hobby that inadvertently led him towards computers. I was buying computers to attach to my robots and control them, but I still build them to this day. I was competing in BattleBots and Robot Wars and all those things. After Will discovered computers, he became obsessed with something else. Games. In his early 20s, Will sunk countless hours into games like Bruce Artwick's Flight Simulator and Bill Budge's Pinball Construction Set. But after realising just how much of his time was eaten up by these games, he decided on a more productive hobby, making his own. The first game was Raid on Bungling Bay, released by Broadabound Software in 1984, when Will was just 24 years old. Bungling Bay put you in control of a helicopter and let you loose on a sprawling landscape of buildings, roadways and military bases, with a quest to drop bombs on a few strategically placed factories to put the evil Bungling Empire, the game's villains, out of action. But Bungling Bay would prove even more important because it was the starting point for Will Wright's next project, Sim City. The idea came to Will as he was making Raid on Bungling Bay. He discovered that it was more fun to build the game's complex cities rather than to bomb them to pieces. So he created an entire game based on the concept of urban planning, where players had to build roads, homes, factories, and emergency services, while also managing their city's electricity supplies, crime rates, pollution levels, and more, all to create their own idyllic virtual metropolis. When SimCity came out in 1989, Nobody had seen anything like it. It was the first in a genre that would become known as the God Game, because it put you in the role of an omnipresent being, looking down upon the world and recreating it as you saw fit. It also gave you complete freedom of gameplay. You could choose to build an organised city that ran like a well-oiled machine, or if you preferred chaos to order, you could just smash your tiny world to smithereens and watch the rubble burn. Either way, it was all good, clean fun. Needless to say, SimCity was a hit, a big hit. The original game would sell well into the millions and set an impossibly high standard for every simulation game that was to follow. In the early 90s, while the world was still reeling from SimCity's impact, Will expanded the game's concept to two totally opposite ends of the spectrum, with SimEarth and SimAnt. While SimEarth pushed simulation to a planetary scale, Sim Ant instead took a magnifying glass to the underground activities of an insect colony. Neither game broke any sales records, and although they did manage to attract sizeable cult followings, it was the sequels to SimCity that would really make Will Wright and his company, Maxis Software, the big name that they are today. Between 1993 and 2007, Will Wright would design four more SimCity games, ranging from the isometric simplicity of SimCity 2000, through to the completely realised 3D world of SimCity societies, with each instalment in the series bringing new challenges, new disasters, and most importantly, new simulations to the familiar Sim formula. 
Over the years, Will and Max's software have made way too many other sim games to mention, including such varied titles as Simcopter and Sim Tower. But for now, let's just assume that if you've ever seen a game with the word Sim in its title, there's a good chance that Will Wright had something to do with it. One last Sim game that we really can't avoid mentioning, though, is this. It's The Sims. And for this, his most successful creation to date, Will Wright had to draw on all of his past experiences in the genre to create a simulation of life itself. In The Sims, you play the typical god figure, although instead of manipulating buildings and roads, you are manipulating people, or Sims, as the game called them. Not only did you control your Sims' career, social life and physical health, but you also had to control when they ate, when they slept, and even when they went to the toilet. They even have their own language, Simlish. It was a risky concept, but it paid off big time. The Sims rapidly became a bestseller, spawning one sequel to date and countless expansions. And while many hardcore gamers are reluctant to admit their affection for the game, the numbers don't lie, with The Sims franchise selling more than 100 million copies worldwide, making it the most popular PC gaming series of all time. With Spore just one week away, we'll finally get to see if Will Wright's latest life simulator lives up to its potential. But if his track record so far says anything about this god game, gaming god, we may just be in for the ride of our simulated lives. And remember, if you want more Will Wright, check out the Good Game website to watch our exclusive extended interview with the man himself. Hi, I'm Will Wright, and you're watching Good Game. Good Game! He's not a genetically engineered super soldier like Master Chief or a prison-hardened badass like Marcus Phoenix. But after seeing the worst that humanity has to offer, Matthias just doesn't care anymore. He's not trying to save the world or even be a part of it. His quest is a monetary one, knowing full well he'll never have enough. And if he did, he wouldn't know what to do with it. It's the lifestyle he fits into, and the only code he lives by is everybody pays. Matthias is one of three characters you can choose from in the latest Mercenaries game. Your story begins with helping out in a Venezuelan military coup, then being betrayed by your employer. When you finally heal from your ass wound, it's on like Donkey Kong, and so begins Mercenaries 2. Six factions are vying for the control of the region's oil supply in what can best be described as Grand Theft Auto in a country-sized map descending into war. You'll have to help them out for money and information about your former backstabbing boss. It should be noted that while Mercenaries 2 is an open-world game, you do get penalised for hurting civilians. Although the game has sparked some controversy from the Venezuelan government, who believes the game is training the US populace to believe Venezuela should be invaded. Maker's Pandemic Studios have made US military training games before, in the form of Full Spectrum Warrior, but have said that no communication has taken place between them and the US government on Mercenaries 2. Interestingly, the Los Angeles branch of Pandemic coded most of the game, but all the motorcycle and ladder code was actually done by our very own Brisbane branch of Pandemic Studios. Is that so? That's true. And, you know, it wouldn't be the same game without it, John. It'd just be a one-story truck fest, wouldn't it? And pretty much after you go from two wheels, it's just copy and paste it's, anyway. Yeah, it's too much. The massive world makes up for it, but the graphics aren't really what you'd expect from this generation of consoles. Uh, 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 oh, motorcycles aside, of course. Although the huge amounts of firepower that you can call in works great with this environment where everything is destructible. Having problems sniping a guy in a window? Take out the building. There's no cover system, and you regen health when you're out of combat. A big explosion or a tank shell will take you down to two health, and often the next one will take you down to one. And this is about as real as a one-man army, but it adds a sense of peril without punishing you. Your first few missions for every faction will be against the Venezuelan army, a common enemy. But after a while, the factions will start turning on each other, and each of your actions will affect the greater balancing act of faction reputation. Keeping up faction reputation is important because you'll need to use their landing pads and air support, and there might come a time where you need that Chinese sniper kit or a tank buster from the oil company does the trick against armor. 
You can disguise yourself as another faction when you attack a faction and blame it on them. Likewise, you can disguise yourself as the same faction you're attacking to get an easy and take out a VIP. Although you do get double money for bringing the VIP back alive, so some of these missions are a bit more than run and gun. Still, none of it compares to the ladders and the motorbikes. Well, the rest of the game brings them down, really. The AI can be a bit funny. Sometimes it'll die due to its own splash damage. They also seem to think that walking up to your tank with an assault rifle is a good strategy. And sometimes if you call for an airdrop next to a building, the airdrop will actually land on top of the building, which is completely useless to you. And I don't know, Junk, am I becoming a jaded game reviewer? I felt this was very PS2. Well, maybe you're just a bit spoiled from GTA. Mercenaries 2 will suffer the same criticisms as GTA. Sometimes you're required to drive to the other side of the map for no apparent reason. Uh, long missions with no checkpoints that get harder as they go, so you have to start over if you die. And some people enjoy that kind of difficulty, but for the majority, it's the type of thing that makes you put the controller down. Audio felt a bit neglected. Most characters only have three things to say, and they say them a lot. We also noticed a bug where if a lot of action was going on, certain sound effects wouldn't load, and whilst we have to mention these kind of things, it doesn't really detract from what I thought was a pretty fun game. I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10. You know, I think I liked it a little bit more than you, and this isn't really my type of game. Yes, the graphics aren't really what you'd expect from this generation of consoles, but the massive world and the firepower make up for it, so you let it be. Also, online co-op where you can revive your partner will make it that much more fun. I'm giving you eight and a half out of ten rubber chickens. Good game! So, did you guess the game for this week? It was Cannon Fodder, first released on the Commodore Amiga in 1993. The game put you in charge of a squad of hapless soldiers. You had to keep them alive as you blasted your way through the jungle, teeming with hostile enemy soldiers. As well as being a great action game, it was known for its satire, poking fun at war at any given opportunity. Even the promotional tagline, war has never been so much fun, was all for the lols. How many lols would you give it, Badge? Well, definitely eight. Lol, 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 lol. lol. Yeah, that's eight. Next week, Spore. It has to be one of the most anticipated games in years, promising to deliver gamers an epic story of discovery. But does it? Does it? All will be revealed. In an anticipation of the latest Star Wars game, Force Unleashed, we'll be going back a long time ago. 1982, in fact. To a galaxy far, far away to see where it all began, gaming-wise, anyway. Till then, Junglist out. Bajo out. You know, we should have a Murloc competition, like an impersonation. I think your one's not so bad. Can you give us a demo? A real rubble, 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 rubble. Okay, it's not great, but I think I think we can, you know, do better. To the forums. To the forums. To the forums. To the forums. To the forums.